if you could go programs, any logic seven, it'll probably say educational and that'll be good. Okay, so TAs, please uh, deploy and circulate. Okay, so who needs help from a TA? Okay, you should be able to start any logic up here. So start menu, all programs, any logic seven, I think it says educational, and then click on the icon. Okay, the TA stand ready to serve. Who would like TA help? Okay, okay, we're 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 off to a good start. Great. Um, okay, so AnyLogic is going to go through some work to start up. I understand from the TAs that on your computers it's significantly faster than on mine. Um, so you'll have to you'll have to have patience with my slow, ponderous um, uh, progress. Okay. When any logic comes up, I think you should see a screen like this. Is that right? Yeah? Okay. Um, any logic uh, offers a variety of, of tutorials and example models on its own. And depending how the boot camp goes, we may dive into some of those. And you could browse to them here with example models or getting started or go through tutorials. But none of that is going to be our focus right now. Instead, we're going to go and we're going to minimize this screen. And this will present you with, with a, a screen that, that's organized into pieces, okay? Um, in contrast to my, to my really training-oriented, strongly education-oriented boot camps where we teach how to build models step-by-step, step, I'm not going to be going to all these things in detail. But we're going to be using this screen as kind of our home base as we build and interact with models in the course of this week. Okay, um, in order to use this, we're going to first get a model that we're going to load in. So right now, there's no model loaded. That's why this is blank over here on the left. You'll notice if you go click around here, there are these things called uh, tabs, which many of you are familiar with. Um, and you can actually click on them and you'll see various sorts of information. This gives you information on the various building blocks, the pieces we can use to build these models. Pretty soon we're going to have a whole lecture about why you want to build these models, what they mean, etc. But right now I'm going to start, as I am wont, and as some of you know, with a buzzing, blooming confusion. We're going to get you in front of a model and have you run it and see what you can do with it, etc. Okay. So I'd like you to switch back to projects there by clicking on projects. And you'll notice it's blank. It's awaiting some information. So the ne next thing we're going to do is we're going to actually go and we're going to download from this very URL. We're going to download your first model that we're going to be using. So I'm going to do this with you. Let's begin. Okay, so the TAs uh, stand, stand ready to serve as always. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call up a browser. Um, I think all of yours should have Chrome on it, I was told. Is that, is that right? There should be Chrome there? Okay, so you should be able to, I mean, you could call up Internet Explorer. My preference would be to call up Program, and there should be Google Chrome, and call up Chrome. Okay? Chrome is a, a browser like Internet Explorer, like Firefox, and we're going we're gonna to make use of it without privileging it. It's just going to be our, our preferred browser so that we can all be on the same page. Okay, so uh, Chrome should come up. Are any of you having trouble locating Chrome? Okay, uh, back, Alan. Okay, um, others? The TAs, okay, so you got Chrome up? Okay, bright and shiny? Okay, um, great. Uh, so let's, let's go here and let's type in this URL here. So I'm going to type it in front of you. It's going to be, whoa, HTTP. No, I don't want to go to Microsoft.com. Uh, tiny URL. Oops, I don't want to do this all in uppercase. Tinyurl.com slash SK. That's the, that's the abbreviation of our fair province. Service Networks, Networks Materials 2.0. 
2015-2015. So, that's a handful. HTTP slash slash, that's forward slash, not bank slash, forward slash tinyurl.com forward slash SK Service Networks Materials 2015. And, and that is with capitalized SK and for S for service, for networks, and for materials. Okay, I'm going to, to type that in, and you'll notice that, that we come to something like this. I'll, I'll put it up there again just so you have time. Um, okay, who needs TA help? They stand ready in a phalanx. Okay, who needs them? Okay. Okay, so uh, would people like this up there a little bit longer? The silence is deafening. <laughs> okay, going, going, gone. Okay, so so I'm gonna press enter here, and it's gonna bring me to the site where you'll. The sets of places we're, we're, we're putting things, binder contents, any logic examples, and there's something called live examples. That's what we want. The any logic examples has dozens of examples of health and healthcare models, some of them created by your fair TAs and your not so fair instructor. <laughs> um, but uh, live examples is going to have the examples for the uh, for class that we're going to be exploring interactively in class. So I'd like you to go double click on this. Boom. Just like that. Um, okay. And you'll find out there that there's something called, and the full name of it is obscure. It's, it's uh, one that involves uh, crowding disparities and, and service networks. I'd like you to double click on this guy. Okay. And now you'll see in front of you a certain file. Who needs TA help? They stand ready. Okay? Some of them sit ready, but they're mostly standing. Okay? Um, okay, now what I'm going to do uh, might enjoy refinement. So any of the TAs, please speak as if in a Greek chorus, if you know a better way to do this. But I'm going to show you a way that works. But it's a little bit ugly. Okay, Dylan, there should be a way to, to, to say download this, but I don't see a direct way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this and then do this download thing here. Okay? Click, so how did I do that? Click here, and then I'm going to say download. And you'll notice it's put it down here. Uh, it's downloaded it onto your computer. And I'm going to say show in folder. So I'll rehearse this again. So uh, what I did is I came to this place. I'm going to go back to where I started. I went to live examples. Actually, you just have to click once. It turns out crowding disparities. I clicked on this, and I did download, just like that. And, and it downloaded it to my disk. And then what I said is I clicked here, and I said show, show in folder. It will show where it is. OK? OK. That's great. Okay. So are people feeling comfortable with that? Show folder. Show folder. Okay. You, you want me to, to, to show that again? So to do show folder, you click here. You, it downloads it. And then you should be able to pull down this menu, which should say show in folder. Okay. Now, this uh, this um, uh, name here should have a little icon next to it that it indicates it's associated with any logic here. And this is an any logic model which um, any logic will know how to read and and load into itself. 
And uh, in order to load it in, you should be able to just uh, double click it. So once it's there, once you see it here, you should be able to just double click and it will load it up in any logic here. Okay? So, so let's, let's go through the, okay, TA, TA help needed uh, sector one. Sector one, Raheem? Sector one. Okay, TA help two, two, uh, two needs in sector one. Okay, uh, three needs, uh, the back there, the back, scan, TA scan for hands. Okay, uh, Priyasri to your left. Uh, oh, okay, um, uh, Aiden to your left, over there. So, Nick, one of the problems yes. is on some computers it's not associated with any logic, so yeah. if they go in any logic, file, open, download, okay. it. Okay, okay, thank you. So it's not associated with any logic somehow? Some of them, okay. So I'm gonna rehearse a different way of doing this. This is uh, grim. Um, file, open, open, and then you'll do downloads, and then you find it. Okay, so, so folks, um, apparently there's inconsistencies between the different computers. We're gonna have to report this back to the mothership. Um, so what you, what you need to do here is that a, a way that will always work, cross my fingers, is you'll go up to file, watch this, from inside any logic, go up to file, open, and then you select downloads, and then you can find it. Okay? Okay. Okay, it's a snafu. Okay, ah. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, could could one of you acquaint um, uh, our magician here with this issue? Uh, in other words, Merlin. Okay. Okay. Um, could uh, Anahita? Could you could you introduce? Oh well, okay. Um, uh, Aiden, could you introduce Merlin here to the problem with the lack of association? Okay. 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 Great. No, no, no. Uh, uh, tell him Merlin's right here. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. So, um, sorry for that snafu. It looks like there was some inconsistency in setting up the computers. Okay. Are, does everyone have any this loaded in now? Were you were able to load it? Okay. Who needs TA help still? Who's beyond help? Okay, um, Okay. so ladies and gentlemen, having loaded it in, what you can do is expand it over here. How do you expand it? You expand it by clicking this little, this little um, triangle. And what you'll see is actually um, a, uh, the various pieces of them all writ large. They're shown, shown here on the, on the left-hand side. And you'll notice that three things stand out. What are the what are those names? The things in red. Clinic, main, and person. So this is this model is something about a clinic, something about some sort of service location, something about a person. <laughs> That's good. It's you know we're not in a, in a business of educating vet scientists in this session. Um, uh, and then there's something about Maine, and we'll come back to that notion of Maine. That's sort of the environment in which people will circulate. But, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to start with this buzzing, blooming confusion by clicking on baseline and right-click on it and select run. Let's, let's rehearse that again. Over here on the left-hand side, there's this triangle. I'd like you to click on this. It'll expand it. And then there should be something called baseline. This is an experiment, ladies and gentlemen. This is a, this is sort of a, a the model represents a theory for how things work. And this, this, this particular experiment is going to run that theory with certain assumptions about the particulars. So we're going to right click on this and select run. Okay, just like that. Um, run. And, and I'm going to, there's that, and you'll notice that any of those a bit of work. And it is, it should now call up a model interface like this. Do people see that? Do people see that? Okay. Um, good. 
Good. We're cooking with gas. Okay. Who would like TA help? Okay. The TAs are now veterans. Okay. Who would like TA help? Okay. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to say run here. Okay. And you'll see you'll see some things in this population here. There, there's there's little figures which are stylized representations of of people, and they're connected together by these these networks. Now, over time, some of these people's color is changing, which is going to be, as we'll find out, reflective of their health state evolving. But if you go and you right click on this by the right mouse button and you drag down, you should be able to see a set of graphs up here on the upper left. And I'd like you to note that over time, these graphs will have information put on it. We're going to go and we're going to run this model as fast as possible. I'd like you to go click on this button here. You'll see this X1. There'll be another button. And then this one here, it says toggle real-time virtual mode. Let's press that. And you'll see a lot of things going on over time. There's, there's a variety of graphs that are being fit, fit in, uh, filled in here. One of the graphs will depict the number of infections that have occurred in a, in a high SES, high socioeconomic group um, uh, part of the population, a low SES part of the population. Another graph shows a histogram for each of those two groups as to how many infections particular individuals have had over the course of the entire time. Think of it as perhaps flu infections over the course of their life. Over here on the left-hand side, we see a graph of a different sort. This is a scatter plot. Again, I'm going to right-click here and drag. And what we see here is income on the x-axis and on the y-axis, a count of infections that a person has suffered. And each dot here represents a particular person with a particular life history, a number of times they've been infected, and a certain in a monthly income associated with them. And broadly, what you see is a sort of gradient of sorts, do you not? There's sort of a gradient. Lower income people have fewer or more infections in this. More infections. They have a larger count of, of cumulative infections over the, over the course of their life to this point. Okay. Um, so these graphs are sort of summarizing information about this population as it ran out. Let's go see, let's go see what lies behind this. You'll notice these distinctive curves. There's, there's this curve showing the rising number of infections here. There is this, this curve showing a histogram here. These, uh, histogram for two different populations. There's this uh, curve showing a, a gradient, and there's this showing the prevalence of infection in these two groups, low and high SES over time, fractional prevalence of infection. So this model is depicting a population, particular people in the population, and it's also depicting information about the population as a whole. Let's, let's go take a look, though, at something here. We can go up to this area here and dive down to particular people in the population. There should be a thing which confusingly says root colon main. And if you dive down in that, how did I do that? I went and I clicked here and I selected population. And you'll notice it says zero. I can go between different people in the population from zero, for example, to one. And this shows different individuals in the population in what state they are currently with respect to recover their, their infection status and whether they're under care or seeking care at the current time. So going between different individuals, we'll find people also differ in terms of their incomes. There'll be some individuals with comparatively low monthly incomes and some that are quite high. Um, so here we have a depiction of each individual within the population, each of the 999, uh, excuse me, the 1,000 individuals. And by clicking on this, we could see the, the characteristics of that person, the particular state that they're in right now with respect to care seeking and with respect to their infection and their characteristics such as their income. We also note that they have a certain number of connections to other people. 
which might represent family or friends or what have you. So, so let's go dive into this a little bit more. Um, I've just closed that window to come back to this. How did I close that window? I clicked on the X in the upper right. Um, there's several ways to actually do it. I'll run it again so you can see that. I wasn't, I wasn't careful enough in showing it to you. It's this X in the upper right to close it. So we can say close. And we'll come back now to this guy. Who needs TA help here? The TAs arranged in formation along the back wall, scanning in a vigilant fashion. Okay, good. Um, I appreciate their service. Um, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, you've just seen a lot of stuff going on. Population, somehow showing individuals, some they, somehow they were situated spatially in terms of their location, in terms of networks and context. Each of those people seem to have some sort of state associated with them and characteristics like their income. Let's go see a little bit more about this. So let's go double click on person. Just like that, okay? And what we're going to do here, at the risk of, of, a, of a measure of, um, of, of confusion, we're going to double, so I double clicked on that and you should see this. Do people see that? Do people see this, this thing here? Now, it's kind of constrained. We, we, we only are getting a glimpse, a sliver of this person. And to enlarge this, I'd like to go double click on person here, and now you'll see the canvas more completely. It's not a work of a Rembrandt. It's not a work of a, of a, a Picasso, but um, it, it has a, a certain consistency to it. Um, so over on the left hand side, you'll see the state chart. Where did we see this before? Not three minutes ago. Anyone remember? Remember we were browsing that population? Each person had a certain state. They were either recovered or they were susceptible. It was, it was, one was red here. It showed what they currently were. Same thing with undercare. Ladies and gentlemen, this, that was showing for a particular person. This is showing kind of a, for this model, a theory of personhood. What it means to be in, in this particular model of person. And, this model, models like maps are designed for a purpose. You have a, a, a road map or you have a, topo, a, a map of the topography or hydrological map or an electrical connectivity map. And so it is with models. Models are built for a purpose. They, they have a theory for, to investigate a particular problem. They'll advance the theory of the relevant factors and let us through, think through the implications. So this is advancing a theory of what it means to be a person here. So we have people categorized with respect to infection status in a susceptible state, a mildly infected state, a, a severe infection state, and a recovered state. And these individuals can go, uh, can have waning immunity. So if they're recovered, think about a condition like uh, STIs like gonorrhea or chlamydia, um, and certainly fast mutating infections like, uh, like flu. You may be recovered from a previous infection, but you can quickly become susceptible to the latest strain or the latest, uh, the, the latest, uh, uh, latest type in, in the gonorrhea context. Um, so here, um, we have individuals, they can progress between different states over time, and there's some fancy stuff here going on, but, but over time they can lose immunity and they can come back to a susceptible state. So this is kind of a, a theory, and, and it turns out it'll be quite quantified. If we dive down, we'll see very specifics here. But then there's an additional theory as to a different side of this person, and it relates to care seeking, whether they're, they're not seeking care or whether they, in fact, sought care and, and are currently under care. And they re-examine their situation periodically, as shown by this loop. So we have here kind of a depiction of, of a theory of a person with respect to states they can be in and how their, those states, their current status evolves over time. And there's, there's an indication of their, their income. For Each person is associated with an income. That's part of a, a theory of being a person here. And there's some other information recorded, like the count of times they've been infected over their life course to this point. So people here 
are circulating in the model, some of them are exposed to infection several times, and each time they get infected, we'll sort of put a, an extra check in that count times infected, an extra tick to record, record how many times they've gotten infected. You'll notice there's also something called destination clinic, and that, ladies and gentlemen, will bring us to the next point here. So this is the point where I'll get a little bit, um, it, you'll have to be careful. You'll notice that, are you folks seeing this sort of in this full screen sort of way here? So it's shown. So if you double click again on this person thing, it'll put it back to the state it was in before. So you double click to make it full, double click to put it back. Are you comfortable with that? Okay. So having put it back, again, if you were like this, just double click and be sure you don't click on that X. Bad things will happen if you don't. We'll have to open it up again. Um, uh, like double click in person. Um, okay. Um, so we're back to this. I'd like you to now go look at clinic. We didn't really see clinics in our encounter yet, but we'll be seeing them in closer familiarity than we'd like. So if you don't go click on, double click on clinic and then double click on this tab there, you'll see a clinic shown. So here we have a clinic sort of logic associated with it. It involves a set of steps. It involves um, allocating a, a healthcare worker, such as a nurse, to this particular case, a uh, person undergoing treatment. Um, there's some uh, indication as to whether or not they're cured by that treatment, so whether it's effective or not, and there's some decision as to whether behavioral counseling should be offered. If this is a frequent flyer, perhaps there'll be some time taken to sort of work with them um, to talk about risk factors. Whereas uh, if it's just a one-time person you haven't seen before, partner of a, of a frequent fire perhaps, or, or a, a new case that, um, uh, that doesn't seem to be engaging in risk behavior, you might, you might uh, release them sooner without this added behavioral counseling. So it's kind of a map of a treatment process here within a clinic context. And we're going to see how this plays out in just a minute. Okay, so we have clinics. We have people, and people will be presenting for care at these clinics. Okay, buzzing, blooming confusion. I know. Um, why are we doing this? What does this give us? Well, we'll be getting to that. Let's, let's, let's play around with it a little bit more. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we saw earlier how we could run the baseline. We're going to do that again, and this time we're going to pay a little bit more attention to what's going on. So we're going to write, how do, we, how do we run it? Who can tell me from the audience? Okay, right click on baseline and click run. Great. That, um, that's more response than I get from my undergrads. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, they probably all want to text me or something like that. Um, I, instead, okay, so let's, let's go. How do I run this thing as fast as possible? Anyone remember? Yeah, this, this double arrow thing, it's, it's two over from this X1 thing. Yeah. Um, Okay, it's, it's running. Wow, that looks like a Christmas tree, doesn't it? Um, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, how do I move up to see those graphs in the upper left? Okay, so I'm going to right click here and drag, right click and drag. Now, I'll tell you, those colors that we saw, red, green, um, this may be the colors of Christmas, but here they're depicting infection status. Green means someone's susceptible. Red indicates that they're currently infected and uh, in either a mild or severe case, and gray indicates they're, um, they're recovered. That's not permanently recovered. They may, their immunity may wane, but um, they're, they're temporarily recovered. Okay, um, so, so they're temporarily immune. Okay, so I'm right-clicking here and dragging around, and you'll notice these graphs, and I want, to, I want you to pay attention to a couple numbers here. They're important enough, I'm going to actually write them down here. Um, so these graphs summarize across the entire population sort of what's gone on. And there's, there's a couple of things I want to pay attention to. So one is there's sort of a count of infections that have occurred amongst low SES people and high SES, as determined by their income. Um, so this is over time. This is a graph over time. This is a dynamic model. It's running over time. Um, 
And this shows count of infections within that group. So here we have high SES. It's somewhere around, what, 6,000, something like that. So I'll, I'll write it down here. Um, high SES, uh, it's around 6,000. And low SES, what is it? Can anyone read it out to me? What is it roughly? Somewhere up here, 40,000 or so. 39.5 or something like that. So roughly 40K, okay? 40,000. Okay, um, that's a com number of cumulative infections across there. What's the prevalence among high SES people over time here? Well, over time, it looks like among high SES, it's somewhere down here. We can click on this. It's somewhere down here around uh, around five, uh, no, maybe it's just short of 10%, maybe so, so maybe uh, eight, seven percent something like that and for um low SES it's somewhere closer to thirty percent so um I'll put put maybe eight uh seven percent for um seven percent prevalence for high SES and something like thirty ish percent for low SES. Okay? Now what let's suppose we want to put these into to export these. I mean why are we staring at at graphs. Okay, so one thing you could do is you could right click on this and say copy all, and you could go over to Excel and you could paste all the data in. So all this data is exportable. I won't go through it now. We may see that in a later exercise. Just be aware there's data behind this that's just being displayed and we can e easily export it. Okay, um, so here we see sort of a, a, a consequence. Okay, so we've, we've run this model with certain assumptions. Um, and there are these consequences shown. We'll go into those assumptions in just a bit. Um, you'll notice also there's this graph here, which is a histogram, and it's showing there's a peak here um, for the low SES. There's a distinct peak associated with a count of infections over the course of, of their life thus far. Um, and uh, whereas for the high SES, there's kind of a bimodal distribution. It's, it's zero heavy. There's quite a few with zero, and then then there's a peak also up to that upper uh, upper limit. Um, finally, there's that scatter plot over here, which is showing this gradient. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we've seen these patterns. This gradient goes down from about 75, and then it sort of tanks off at around 6,000. And above that, people are pretty well protected, the higher income people. Okay, let's go see what's going on here. Let's, uh, what's going on? Well, that's what we talked about with a theory. What, what, Model, the model theory. We, we saw some elements of what it was positing. Um, fundamentally, there are these people in the population and they can transmit. And when they're in this infective state, they can transmit to their neighbors in this network. Maybe it's an FDI network. Maybe it's a bloodborne infection network sharing needles. Maybe it's a, uh, it's a, a network involving contact for hep A for, for exposure. Um, uh, to, to um, uh, you know, in the context of food preparation. But we have these people in these different states and they can expose others. That's what these transitions are. Um, and eventually they can recover. So those patterns we just saw, those patterns that, that we looked at, like that gradient, did anyone see me put these into the model? Where did I put that gradient into the model, the gradient by income? Anyone see that? Is there a little gradient here somewhere? No? Where is it? Uh, um, you know, is, is, it, is it here? Maybe, maybe it's up in Maine. Let's go take a look at what's in Maine here. Um, well, I don't, see, I don't see that gradient in Maine. I didn't tell it about that gradient. Where did that gradient come from? Where did that histogram come from? Well, it, it came from the interaction of lots of these pieces. No one piece dictated it. It came from an interaction of, of how people go in these these sort of stages of infection, this natural history of infection, how they transmit to others with different likelihoods in a mild state and a severe state. It came from this sort of placement of them by income, and it came from, it, it, in cases where we assume clinic interactions, the nature of what's going on in the clinic. It's a, it's a tangled mess of all these different factors. Have you ever seen problems before which are a tangled mess of a various set of factors in health and healthcare? Yeah, like our entire healthcare system and, and our, our health, the public health we have to deal with, 
often in the population health context, you have this, you have issues which are tangled mixtures of social issues, issues having to do with, with uh, nature of particular diseases, certainly, also issues having to do with the demography and the, the, uh, the balance of, of uh, social determinants of health, opportunity structures, and issues having to do with, with different areas of our health care system that may be working together or at cross purposes. Service networks from different uh, allied health professionals that interact to shape people's life course in terms of their health. The real world has all this entanglement of these different factors. And with these models, we can capture the implications of that entanglement. We can represent a clinic. We can represent care-seeking behavior on the part of a person and a theory about how that takes place motivated by health symptoms. We can, we can reflect a theory of sort of how infection um, takes place, the stages of that infection, the level of, of susceptibility based on a person's age or what have you. We can capture this in a model and see the implications, as we just did. So we, we did with this baseline, and those features that we saw there, those patterns like that gradient, that's an emergent feature of this model. We call it emergent. It, it's not programmed into the model. We didn't say make there be a gradient. Rather, it emerged from the interaction of a variety of these components, the shape of the network, the level of crowding, the income gradient, and a variety of factors. We can go into all sorts of details, and we will with this very model later in the week, but for now, just be aware it's capturing this entanglement to these different components. We're studying how the behavior of the whole um, proceeds over time and as histograms, recognizing that it's different from merely the sum of the behavior of the pieces. We're dealing with system science here, ladies and gentlemen, the science of the whole. Okay? So let's take a look at this in a little bit more detail with another major use of models. So we just ran the so-called baseline scenario, which had certain basic assumptions. Let's go look at what those assumptions are. Click on baseline here, and I'd like you to drag this thing over, and you'll notice there's this area here. There's some sort of administrivia here, but there's this area called parameters. Okay, the TA stand ready. Um, a TA just left the structure. Um, hey, TAs, come on in. Um, Okay, so uh, who needs help getting to this property? What did I do? Well, um, I went and I clicked on baseline. I went over here to properties and I clicked on parameters to expand it so you can see these parameters. Do you see these? People, who would like, like TA help? TAs? Okay. Um, okay, uh, the stalwart TAs are ready to serve. Um, Okay, so let's take a look at these parameters. These encode assumptions. The, the model kind of depicts the theory as to how things work in the world, and the parameters show the particulars. Yes? How can I purchase online reminder or whatever that is? Purchase online. Uh, say uh, cancel. Uh, that was something I was warned by our IT staff. The, you don't have to purchase a service agreement, and it's reminding you that, hey, your service agreement is overdue. It's nothing you have to worry about. It's just this installation. The manager of the installation has to think about a service agreement, getting a service agreement renewed for these computers. If, if they want to be able to report bugs and have any logic help them find, you know, uh, put in place fixes for bugs, that's when it will show that, or that message. It says you're, you're due for service or something like that. It's nothing you have to worry about. Okay, so over here are these properties, ladies and gentlemen, as shown for the baseline. These are, again, the model depicts a theory of the world, of these entangled factors, and these are particular assumptions that make that theory specific to a context, or a particular case. So here we have, for example, some total population, a, a contact rate, number of contacts per day assumed, the, an initial fraction of the population that's accepted, how long the infection lasts, um, uh, how far apart people are and still be um, uh, to the point where they can still be connected, um, 
And there's a set of other particular assumptions here. You'll notice in this model, we ran it with zero clinics. There was no care-seeking behavior because there's no clinic to which to present. We're gonna change that now, okay? So this is a, a set of baseline assumptions. And we ran an experiment, we saw the consequences of these assumptions together with that theory. Models like this bring together theory, ladies and gentlemen, and data. Again, they take that theory out of our head, they put it in a way that we can inspect it, openly talk about it, jointly critique it and advance it, and then they allow us to combine it with data, which might be gained from a variety of empirical data sources, from meta-analyses, from primary data collection, from surveys, from any number of different uh, sources. They combine that data with the theory to understand the implications. So ladies and gentlemen, this is our baseline set of assumptions. Let us now go examine a different set of assumptions. So I'd like to go over here on the left-hand side and select a different experiment. Baseline with one clinic. And up here, you should now see baseline with one clinic. Who needs help here? Help? Okay. Um, okay, baseline with one clinic. What was the assumption from this, uh, what was the difference from this other one? If we went and looked at baseline, and we looked at baseline with one clinic, what do you think, see the difference as being? Well, it's actually in bold here. The count of clinics is different. The count of clinics here is one. That's why it's called baseline with one clinic. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's run this model. Let's run it here. And we'll see now there's an actual clinic depicted. And we can run this quickly. And you'll find if you go to this main and you drag down, you'll find a depiction of sort of this clinic in operation. This clinic is, is handling large numbers of universe, large numbers of individuals as, as the, uh, the model continues. And here we have a depiction of clinic flow over successive stages of care delivery. And you'll find uh, annotations here which indicate how many individuals, for example, have flowed one way or to another. For example, the this represents balking behavior, the fact that an individual may leave the clinic if they're waiting too long. That's associated with this path here. And just over uh, five, uh, so, so a, uh, a large number of individuals, it looks to me like uh, 529, um, so zero, 529,000 individuals have passed through, but but uh, at this point, there's been uh, no balking by those individuals. Um, we see individuals, how many have actually um, had their uh, clinical outcomes um, examined, how many have made it to the state where they're releasing the healthcare worker, et cetera. So these, these, uh, these numbers here indicate how many have gone one way or the other. And excuse me, this is a large amount of balking that went on. I misread that. A large number of cases balked a smaller number of cases actually made it through. So a large number of cases went to the FDI clinic or went to this clinic for care and said, hey, this is uh, too busy. You'll notice there's a resource utilization number here given for the nurses. Is that high or low? They're essentially almost always under use. The nurses are always busy, okay? Um, so here we have a depiction of this clinic. So the clinic's been a busy place, but a large number of people have balked. How do you think having this clinic has affected things, ladies and gentlemen? Well, let's go, go up to the top level again, and again, right click and drag down. Let's go check, check out these statistics. How do you think, how, much, how many people think here this clinic has helped enormously? A lot of people balking. How many people will think that it will have halved the, um, the prevalence of infection? Now we can get people treated more quickly. How many people think that it has lowered it by less than 10%? How many people think anything about it? <laughs> okay, okay, let's, let's take a look at the numbers here. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. So here, 
we're going to first look at this prevalence of infection. Excuse me. We'll first look at this uh, count of infection. So here we have this cumulative count of infections. Okay, before we had high SES individuals, uh, about 6,000. And what do you think it is here? Well, looks closer to, what, maybe 10? I mean, we could go export this. I'll actually show you how you can do that. I'm not asking you to follow, but I will, I will do it. I'll say copy all just so I can go over and and find um, what the actual number is here. I'm going to call up Excel here. You don't have to do this, but um, I'm going to do it so I can get you a better number. So cumulative number of high SES individuals um, by time 1,000. Oh, OK, it says more items available. OK, OK, it doesn't show it to the final time there. That's, that's curious. Um, yeah, so. Um, I would have expected to uh, to copy all of that. Um, hmm. uh, in any case, it it looks to me to be around uh, uh, maybe around uh, ten thousand, and this number here looks to be around um, eighty thousand. Okay, so how does that comp okay with the baseline with no clinic? We have about forty thousand for low SES cumulative infections. Now we have something like. 80 or 90, how is that possible? Come again? We have a clinic in place. This clinic is treating people. I didn't show you all the details of that because I don't want to overwhelm you any more than I have already. Um, but, but this clinic, with the clinic in place, we have almost double, more than double perhaps, the number of cumulative infections among low SES individuals. What's going on? We have, we have also a lot more, it seems, among the, the high SES individuals, although the, the gap, the disparity is, or the gap there, the, the change is less pronounced. Why is this? How could that possibly be the case? Could it be a fluke? Could it could be a fluke of, of, of the situation? I mean, after all, this depends on chance who's infecting who. We could always run this model again and, and see, you know, is it, is it yielding the same results? And in fact, there will be some variability. You can go down to, excuse me, model randomness, and you can tell it, um, oh, in fact, it says run it separately with every time it's going to be, um, it's going to be running it with different particular assumptions about who contacts who. I'll run it again. Let's see, maybe that was a, a figment of chance. Okay. Um, so, so we're running this, and while wow, those numbers are going up, they've already exceeded this number for the low SES population. What? It's, it's going up above 80K. It's over double the amount. It's not just a fluke, ladies and gentlemen. I could run this again and again and again. I'll see the same pattern. How could this be? How could it be that we put in place this clinic and we have more infections? Ah. Okay, so maybe it has something to do with how people are connected to each other. That's a good idea. What does a clinic do, ladies and gentlemen? What does a clinic do? It tests and treats, right? Okay, tests and treats. So, so by treating someone, we in this in this model, I'll show you. In the theory of the model, we can go dive down to the person here. Um, and actually, we'll have to scroll way down here to the population. When someone's treated, they actually go back from an infective state to a susceptible state directly. So we assume that we, we sort of treat them quick enough that, they're, that they're, um, their immune system doesn't put them in a recovered state. Rather, they go back to a susceptible state. Can anyone see why that? might jive with the with with what we've just seen so if if we assume that if we assume that treating them puts them immediately back to a susceptible state could you imagine a case where where actually over the course of their life treatment is actually increasing the number of infections yeah so we've thrown them back in we've tossed them back into their sexual network or their risk the risk network 
in an unprotected state rather than them going on to a recovered state eventually where they would have been protected for some time. Now, this is not merely an idle thought. Um, there have been uh, powerful voices here in Canada, Bob Brunham, for example, at BCC to C, who have posited exactly this is going on for chlamydia. And there's lab studies that suggest that it's plausible for, for uh, the, an animal models uh, that, that fundamentally early treatment may, through antibiotics, may in fact blunt the immune response and therefore prevent you from building up an immunity that would have protected you for a certain period of time. Now, that's not to say it's bad necessarily, but this individual could be infected more times because instead of having this period where they are protected through natural immunity, they've been thrown back into the susceptible state and they could get infected again. I'm not saying this is necessarily true for a particular infection, but if we have a theory of the world where, where treatment leads to susceptibility immediately, it is possible that we could have this case that adding a clinic leads to more counts of infection on the part of an individual. Greater counts of infection on the part of an individual. Okay. So, so, okay. So, so maybe early treatment leads that individual to be susceptible quicker and therefore they have a chance to get infected again sooner than they otherwise would have. How about in terms of prevalence of infection? Um, Surely they're spending less time infected once you're treating them. Um, they're spending more time susceptible. Well, word only so in this model. Um, in the low FES population for the baseline, we had a prevalence of 30%. Here it's 40, 40%. It's gone up. These individuals who were treated and are now infected sooner actually can infect others, whereas if they had gone on to a recovered state, been immune for a while, they wouldn't have infected others. So in this case, this, this treatment clinic, if we posit this theory of how the infection works, it's actually, from a population health standpoint, it's actually worsened things somewhat. Now, mind you, it's not nearly been as effective as it could have been because um, a large number of people are balk balking here in the clinic because of the waiting times. But even so, it has materially changed these uh, statistics. You'll notice that this gradient here has been, it still persists, but it's even a little bit higher up. Now we have more infections going on per person um, by, by a bit. Um, okay, so uh, here, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to... Um, uh, we're going to now examine the effects of adding clinics. So let's let's take um, let's take several uh, several additional uh, additions to this. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to add now um, three clinics. So so one, but three. What do you think the situation will be now? So we have three clinics serving this population. There's one. Okay, this other one is, uh, two of them are pretty far out there. Um, okay, um, what's going on there? I just ran it. What, what happened? Oh, let's try that again. Baseline with three clinics. Let's try running that. Again, maybe I missed something. Okay, try running it. Huh? What's going on? What's going on, folks? Anyone? Why are these lines flat? What does it mean that the count of cumulative infections is flat? If it's not going up, the count of cumulative infections to this point, if that's not rising, what does it mean? Steady state. Steady state, meaning that no new infections are occurring. So, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, we had one clinic that seemed to worsen things, three clinics actually got better. You'll notice there's, there is still this gradient here, but we're seeing, we're seeing the scatter plot reduced to either zero or ones. You know, some people had one infection. Most people had zero infections across the income profile. Wow. Um, so, so increasing the number of clinics further, one clinic seemed to worsen things. Increasing the number of clinics further suddenly improved things. How could that be? How could that be? That 
that one clinic worsened, three clinics made it a lot better. Can anyone posit an explanation for that, a narrative? Well, <laughs> okay. Uh, I didn't. I didn't change that part of my theory. I didn't say, you know, there's, you know, the, the new clinics are filled with Einsteins or something like that, or, or you know, filled with Bantings, uh, Gallens, and uh, and uh, uh, and Bethunes. So I didn't. I didn't posit that. I didn't make any assumptions about that. How is it that three clinics might help where one didn't? How is it that, that we could see this change? I mean, this is a qualitative change. It's not merely we, we bent the curve. I mean, we, we, we straightened the curve in a dramatic way. Well, well okay, if, if we're fast enough out of the gate treating people, we may be able to prevent the infection from, from getting started in the population. We may be able to, for, to snuff it out at first. And that's indeed what's going on, folks. At the very first, we had some individuals infected, but it ended up it ended up uh, snuffing out. If we go uh, look at this in the first little bit of of uh, the model's evolution, we had people getting infected, but pretty quickly it was contained. Why? Because we had the resources to treat people quickly. We achieved the centuries-long dream of of uh, of infection control and achieved a snuff out of, of the infection. We got the basic reproductive number less than one. There are a couple cases early on and we snuffed it out. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to highlight some things to you here. There's, there's a very curious thing going on here. And we, we talked early about emergence, but there's a feature also of nonlinearity here. Um, that's illustrated in these results. I mean, you you, in, you you have some baseline. This is if this is cumulative number of infections, some baseline number. You you put in place one clinic. It actually worsens things. You put in place several clinics. It dramatically improves things. Um, reasoning about each clinic in isolation. How much does a clinic help? Just breaks down as a line of reasoning. You, to understand this well, you have to understand the entanglement of, okay, how quickly we can treat people and, and something about their contact networks and something about how the infection spreads. And, and we have to reason about these things in the context of all these different factors to understand what plays out over time, what the implication is for the gradient in terms of disparities over the, the socioeconomic gradient in terms of the number of people balking. A model does this all for us. So the model takes, takes uh, allows us to specify a kind of theory for how, how things work in the world. Whether that theory is right or wrong, a model helps us specify it so we can more quickly identify if that theory is consistent with the evidence, if it's consistent with our expert observation from being in the system. It helps take that theory out of our heads, the realm of mere speculation, and put it in a form where we can run it, we could see operationally does it jive with, with the evidence that's available. So we've seen that, and we've seen how certain patterns, like that socioeconomic pattern, emerge, emerge from this. And we could examine various other um, uh, variations of this. And in fact, I'd planned to do so, but time is running short. So for example, we could have had three clinics and said, well, what if we engage in behavioral counseling uh, additionally, or what if we had 50 clinics, or what if we had one clinic and, and biased it more towards placement in lower income areas? We can examine all those what if scenarios here and see the consequences as they are logically implied by our theory in our data. Now, is this theory necessarily correct? Most certainly not. These are not crystal balls, ladies and gentlemen. Rather, they're learning tools. As, as Dr. McDonald here says, they're learning prostheses. They help us think through the consequences of our assumptions more quickly, more thoroughly, and more robustly than we can do in our head and see if it jives, among other things, with empirical evidence. But more than that, ladies and gentlemen, they help us look at counterfactual situations, situations that have never been examined before 
and help us reason through what would the consequences of those assumptions be if our theory of how the world works holds. So they help us more quickly advance our theory. They help us more quickly identify, identify possible high leverage opportunities for intervening in ways we've never undertaken before and help us identify and key uncertainties that play a disproportionate role in shaping our understanding of which intervention might be best. So this is the enterprise, ladies and gentlemen, of dynamic modeling. And I know this has been filled with buzzing, blooming confusion, and no doubt with no shortage of frustration. But we're going to turn next to a bit of explanation more systematically of what we're doing here and how we can use these models within the health and particularly health services context. Okay, Dylan. Um, I guess before we move on, I just have uh, something I'd like you to comment on if you could. So you were saying that these are not crystal balls and that they're learning tools, but um, I think there also are possibly policy insights you could draw even from something this simple. You saw that increasing the resources, for, uh, in, in particular the number of clinics, made the problem worse but further increasing it beyond a certain point eradicated the problem. So not only did we learn something about how the system changed, but from a policy perspective, we might be able to say, no, it's not about getting another $100,000 or $100 million to make this better. We need $200 million before we will actually make this better or we will cripple people out there or we'll make this worse. So is that something you could gain from a lot of models, not just yeah. understanding, but guidance for how policy might evolve in the future? Okay, so so thanks for the question there, Dylan, um, which was not rehearsed. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, a couple of things on your points there. Um, you're right that ev that even stylized models can help you help you gain ahas that you wouldn't have had uh, otherwise. Um, and yes, they a model can point you to a certain critical mass of investment that is needed to achieve. To achieve benefit. It can also point you to a certain critical time you have to wait to really reliably assess the benefits. This is one of the tragedies we face, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, in the health and healthcare space. Sometimes uh, the best of policies are enacted, perhaps by one government, and, um, and there's not time given for them to really play out fully. And they are judged a failure and shortchanged and, and, and you know, deinstitutionalized before they actually have a chance to really show their effects. When it comes to implementation science, um, which is uh, you know, a big, big focus these days within the NIH space, um, and you know, translational and, and implementation science here in Canada is also getting a lot of limelight. Um, one of the key questions is how quickly can we ramp up to effective, to effective change to, to actually see the difference you know, writ large. And you're absolutely right that, um, uh, that models can help assess the impacts of scale. How, how big do you have to go, which is one of the questions that implementation science, how do you bring it to the necessary scale? And then also, how quickly do we see effects? I would, I would tie that in, though, with one or two additional points. One is, um, and I thought this might be where you were going, um, the measure that we chose, when you said things got worse, in a way, they got worse. But models can help alert you to the shortcomings of certain measures as well. Here I used a measure on um, cumulative number of times people were infected. I could have used a different measure, you know, the number of cumulative infection days over the simulation. And that might have shown different consequences of going, you know, of, of expanding the initial clinic population. So models can help us assess the, the reliability, the robustness, the uh, consistency, and the uh, operationalizability of different measures of, of success. But um, yes, I, th I think those, those are uh, good points, Dylan. And we'll talk about in the next lecture about two very different types of models. Models that are, that are more uh, theory driven and, and are, are more stylized to, to really ther serve primarily as stylized thinking tools, almost caricatures like this model and then models that are more data-rich, grounded by empirical evidence. But both types have to deal with the situation that when we're dealing with counterfactuals, things we've never seen before, the world may look rather different. 
in terms of, of, of some of the empirical patterns than uh, what we started with. So Jenny, yes. Yeah. I think those are very good points. I mean, one additional thing, though, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd point to is um, there's one thing about about saying, okay, with one clinic, it, it, it did poorly with three, it did well. But there's another deeper, deeper point there, which is the chance to go and ask, why did it work? We don't have time to do it. Um, there's going to be a bathroom break real soon now, I promise you. Um, uh, but... Um, but actually, we could have, just like we, we went and we looked at that clinic earlier, how many people got treated successfully, how many balked and left, what you would have seen is that with three clinics, there's a lot fewer people balking, a lot more actually getting treated, and they can get treated early on, particularly, and that's why it was able to snuff that out early on. There wasn't that kind of um, buildup um, of need, which which led to people leaving, which led to people circulating with more infections for longer, and then the infection takes off. We were able to nip it in the bud for several reasons, and we could have you know, drilled down into seeing exactly what changed with those three clinics um, that allowed this to be such a success, and that could have treated us to, to opportunities to sort of formulate new interventions, right, or, or var variants of these interventions. There's all sorts of sort of variants of this that we may explore in coming days. Another one that I'd highlight is the fact that adding behavioral counseling to this whole thing makes a huge difference. It, it's counterintuitive, perhaps, for many. You add an extra stage to your treatment um, pipeline. You, you have extra time taken to treat a patient. It seems counterintuitive to think that could improve the clinic successfulness, but if it means changing people's behavioral risk factors rather than just throwing them out into their, to their risky behaviors in their same sexual network and having them exposed again. It may make a real big difference. That investment up front, it looks like a hit time-wise. It takes extra time. It takes the, you know, the, nurses, uh, the nurse's time or the counselor's time, but it turns out it pays back. So often we get in a situation where it seems it's worse before better, it, it seems like it will make it worse. You take more time per patient up front. You take, you put in place, you know, more um, uh, more clinic capacity, but then you reap the benefits um, that may not be obvious. And the model can help you total those things up better than we can in our head. So anyway, um, thank you very much for your your uh, tolerance of this example. It's the first time we've actually used it, um, but um, I appreciate your your bearing with it. We're going to take a bathroom break now, health break, I think it's called in the, um, in the, uh, the agenda, and we'll reconvene in about uh, 10 minutes for, for some um, discussion about where these models fit in.
Okay? Thanks very much.